Well, hi there. Um, ever heard of the periodic table of elements? You, you might have. You might be looking to learn something about it. I'm in the mood right now where I'm trying to learn something about it. And so I started doing research and got to the point where it was time to do a video to talk about the periodic table elements and, and I'll explain why. So here we are at the National Library of Medicine uh, website. Um, they talk about citing this table here if you're gonna use it. Uh, they provide what you see as a traditional periodic table of elements look. You know, it has this semi-rectangular look. There are different groups of things and colors of things here. And, uh, you know, it's, I never really understood a lot about what all this meant or how it all ties together, even though this table's really cool. And I think we all kind of hold up the, what was it, the uh, um, Mendeleev tables, what they refer to it as well, the, just the design of this. Now, many, um, many years I've been working on a project um, related to genome sequencing. And in, in the pursuit of that project and trying to, to program you know, DNA essentially, or look at how it's all connected, you run into the composition of things. You, know, you run into the composition of uh, amino acids and of um, nucleotides. And th that chemical formula is written out, right? So, you know, we're all going to look for, to get a background in chemistry. I don't have much of one. And so we're just going to talk in very layman's terms. But, you know, like a C5, N5, N5, carbon 5, H5 is hydrogen and nitrogen. Those symbols are obviously a periodic table of element symbols. So when you go to the website, um, this, this PubChem NCBI website here, and they download this table, they give it to you in a raw form, in a raw CSV form if you want it, that looks like this. This is what they give you. And it has very relevant categories related to each element. Um, and so what I'm, I'm really good at doing and expressing data in terms of pivot tables is this is already in the format for a pivot table. So I converted it into a pivot table and that's what we have here. And now, now, with the aid of pivot tables and pivot slicers, we can start to really learn things about these elements in a different way. So I've provided this file for you to download, the Excel file that you're seeing right here, totally free. This is a learning experience here, absolutely for everyone. But I already started to learn things really, really fast, and so I realized it's going to be awesome to share this. So what am I talking about? Well, we have all these different categories related to the elements. Okay, and we've got their symbols and we've got their names. And I've color coded some calculations that are in here that are related to the elements. I've color coded things where the color is, is the red number is a low number. Okay, red, red is essentially, you know, anything right here is a low number and green is a high number. It's on a color coding scale essentially that is basically related to low being red and high being green and yellow stuff is in the middle. OK, well, when you do that, you can start to sort by any one of these things and also look by states and blocks and numbers and names and all kinds of things. So let's do that. For example, let's talk about just gases. All right. If their state is a gas, then they are these elements and their hydrogen helium, and here's their symbols, and here's their group blocks, okay? And here's their standard state and the year that they were discovered. We could also color code the year if we want to, to show things that were discovered more recently. We've got atomic mass, we've got atomic radius. So just from glancing at the, at the gases, what did we learn about this stuff? Because see how the numbers can be hard to read? Like how can you read 8998E05, right? That doesn't mean anything to me when I'm looking at numbers, but red does mean something. It means density very low is what it means because this is the lowest number. So what, what you're going to find as you browse through this is, is man, you're just going to learn a ton of things. You're also going to see where off weird things happen. Like, why is this red? Why is the atomic radius for, um, for fluorine very low? Why is that? What's this halogen block mean? Like there, there's endless learning to go on here, right? What about the liquids? It's like, there's only two liquids? No way. There's only two liquid state elements? That should be a Jeopardy question. None of these are expected to be a liquid. What are they? Bromine and mercury. And we hear all these crazy things about mercury. 
you can see mercury has a larger atomic mass. It's a higher atomic number. I don't know what these ionization energies or electron affinities are. Melting point relatively low, boiling point relatively high, falls within the Earth's normal range because Kelvin is 278 degrees or something um, more than, uh, less than Celsius, sorry. So this, this right here is like 30, 40 degrees. We could convert this into Celsius and figure that out and make it look different. But wow, crazy. What about bromine? Or bro yeah, bromine? Halogen. What are halogens? I don't know what halogens are. We can start looking at all halogens and then unfilter some of these other things and see that here are our halogens, which do weird things, right? I already talked about fluorine being weird and bromine is weird because it's a liquid. So I don't know what halogens are all about. Um, something to learn, okay? So this is amazing. What else do you want to ser search for or sort by? How about atomic mass, right? What is the smallest atomic mass. I would, I would suspect that that is related to atomic number, right? Well, let's make sure of that by doing more sort options under the name and ascending by atomic mass. The lightest element on here is still hydrogen. So it does go sort of in order. Now, the other way around, I don't know, not so much though, maybe let's try out. What about descending by atomic mass? Yeah, pretty much. Okay, so that one follows with atomic number a lot. Well, what about atomic radius? What's the atom with the smallest atomic radius? Can more sort options? Atomic radius smallest? I'm expecting hydrogen, right? Uh, or there's no atomic radius on these. Let's do ascending. I'm just, you just do, it's endless. It's, sorry, ascending by atomic radius. It's endless, which you can do to look at this and filter by. Uh, some of these don't have measurements, but Hydrogen, of course, is basically number one there. Um, all right, so the point of all this, point of all this is that eventually we're gonna take this and combine in calculations to be able to structure our amino acids in a mathematical way. Because right now, uh, as, as I really tried to, to reverse engineer the structure of proteins and polypeptides and such at, at the basic level to truly understand it, we have to have more information here for what these amino acids actually do, right? And so when you see something like guanine, cytosine, adenine, which is what alanine is here, well, those elements that comprise this triplet here are going to be like this. And this stuff needs to have a calculation and a you know, that's what this hydrophobic and polar charge and stuff is doing, is it's describing what the combination of these chemical elements are doing when they're in secession and when they're floating around. And, and it's fascinating to look at representations of this. There are representations of this. This is another site, Biology Pages Info, which I found out, which is, which is really awesome. It's going to show you different representations of things. And so those represent representations and how they form and bond um, are, are big parts of, of the mathematical formula that I'm trying to get at as I design this. So it was necessary to come up with a periodic table of elements application because we have to form it at this granular level, which is the elements and what the elements are doing. Uh, it's going to explain bonding. It's going to explain things. And it's also going to open up a whole other can of worms and, and a million other things that you could do, infinite number of other things. So I, I hope this is helpful for you if you're studying. It's a great tool if you needed to learn, you know, like if somebody wanted to quiz you and be like, do you know all the elements? Which, by the way, I'm going to learn them all now because I'm, I'm going through this so much. There's 118. I already memorized that one. That seems like a weird number, by the way. That can't be the final answer. 118 is never a final answer to any question, unless it's what comes after 117. It's the only question that answers. I don't know why 118 elements is the uh, the number of elements in the universe that we found, but that's where we're at right now. We feel like, hey, what's number 74? It's tungsten. Nice. What about 104? Rutherford 40 and probably named after like Rutherford, Rutherford B. B. Hayes, maybe? I don't know. We're going to start learning things. 14, silicon. Oh, we're going to learn. And also, here's something else. Where are our gases? Uh, it's interesting that we can't highlight the other ones. I was trying to see how we could display this atomic number in a way that would be more appropriate. I guess it's more appropriate being colored right here than it is to be in this thing. Um, but just anyway, this is going to be endless what you can do with this. So if, if you, uh, you want to download a copy right there, it's free in the description. 
And if you have questions about it, or you want me to do stuff with it, or you want to help along the way as I do more videos about sequencing of, um, of genomes and sequencing of amino acids and, and protein structure, and really trying to be able to predict what things will do, because it's my understanding now that science has, it, has a pretty good handle on the components and the building blocks, but there are so many mutations and deviations to a very, very long strings of DNA, RNA, mRNA, that it's just tough, even for computers, to predict what small changes will do. So there is a code here, though, and the, co the code starts with probably the element, you know, the quarks and stuff that even comp comprise these, these atomic elements to begin with inside the electrons, the protons, and the neutrons, or whatever that's in there, right? There's probably even more stuff deeper down, but as far as what we can sort of kind of measure and have a greater understanding about, that's why the periodic table of elements exists. And this is the periodic pivot table of elements, really, is what I should call this. And um, we'll just add to it and change it around and make it even easier to read so that uh, I can start to be able to explain things mathematically through this. And that's the goal. So good luck, everyone. I hope you enjoy it. I hope it helps you. And um, this will be a continuation along these lines. There's going to be a lot of videos about genome sequencing, because if you can really understand at the nucleotide level, right, if you can really comprise structures, because we can, I mean, we, we can, we, we can definitely simulate this stuff and, and, and synthesize. If you could do that, then there's no reason you can't change, you know, your, your genetic cellular expression by just giving it the tools and giving it the code to do that. So it, it's a stepping stone onto programming by, you know, biohacking essentially is I think what they call it now, or just biosynthesizing um, uh, at, at all levels. So I'm trying to understand it and table it because once we all understand it as a, a society, the, just the magnitude of the genetic diseases we can cure through coding, through a coded solution, uh, it's just, it's, it's mind blowing to think about what you could do. And maybe even, you know, there's your figurative found, fountain of youth, essentially, if your cells are expressing out the wrong things and you need them to change, you could recode them. Uh, and we just need to understand how we do it perfectly so that we don't have unintended consequences, which are not what we want. And that's a learning experience and it's going to be a long one, but there's enough computing power out there to do it. I'm sure of that. Uh, even though there are, you know, 3.2 billion nucleotides supposedly in every human cell on average, um, there's still enough computing power to, to, to do things with that, especially if we know what we're looking for. So that's the plan. All right, guys, good luck. Enjoy, enjoy the periodic pivot table of elements.